Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. My guest today is Patrick from Drones for Good. We've seen the evolution of drones over the past decade or so, and now they have got so many functions, ranging from the monitoring climate change, carrying out search operations after natural disasters, photography, filming, delivering goods, and of course the recreational side of the market is absolutely exploding. Today, our frontline lifesavers operate in every single terrain and every single landscape. At day and night, all times of the year, Drones for Good work to provide fully electric aerial drones as an affordable, reliable, and integrated solution for our incidents, missions, minus the emissions, and risk to human life. Drones are a massive step forward, and in terms of the emergency services, they provide situational awareness that helps fire brigades and other emergency services frontline workers in their effective response to incidents. The best way for you to support the podcast is to go on over and take a look at our partners. We don't pick them arbitrarily. They are there because we believe they can add value to your life. First up is, of course, the wonderful William Wood Watches. Founded in 2016, William Wood Watches is an award-winning luxury watch company that upcycles rescue service materials in all of their pieces, embedding every watch with a piece of British firefighting history. The iconic logo on every single watch represents the side profile of a 1920s British firefighter's helmet. It signifies heroism and bravery. It's an incredible pleasure to have Johnny, the CEO, and the whole team on board with the podcast. I've had my Valiant Red Watch for probably the best part of four years now. I absolutely love it. So go on over to Williamwood Watches and check them out, whether it's the Triumph, the Valiant, the Bronze, or the Chivalrous Collection. There is something for everybody at every single price point. Our final partner of the podcast today is Hikes. Now, the Hikes group actually started in 1948. They did, in fact, start out in the firefighting boots market, but Hikes now supplies armies, fire and rescue, medical, workwear, police, military, hunting, forestry, outdoors. I wear Hikes and I'm doing absolutely everything. If it's training from our operational duties, I'm rocking the Fire Eagles. These are boots that you will see by pretty much every member of the British Firefighter Challenge team. And whether I'm out with the dogs or I'm out with the horses, I'm rocking the Black Eagle Athletic 2.0. If you go over and check these out, these are my absolute favorite boots. And for you, dear listener hikes do a giveaway with the podcast every single month so if you head on over to one of the social channels whether it's youtube instagram facebook you can win yourself a free pair of black eagle adventure 2.2 gtx and when i say free i mean absolutely free there are no funny games there is no postage to pay there's no small print or any silly business so if you really want to support the podcast go on over and check out one of our partners there is something there for everybody so there you have it folks that is the names in the frames for today's episode that is the wider podcast family of partners so if you are sitting comfortably let's buckle up for safety and i will see you crazy cats on the other side hey there how are you doing <laughs> hey patrick i'm good my man how are you yeah doing very Fantastic. well Fantastic. what would this need to be for it to be a home run for it to be like damn i love that and we're proud to share it a uh, beautiful question i uh, I think that uh, personally, I would be the most happy if listeners at the end uh, of the show really get a good sense of understanding on how, how the future is already happening, you know, and how, how this is going to actually change the whole environment for emergency services for the first responders in the field, and that they understand how complex, but also how beautiful the, the, the trying to make a positive impact part is. Patrick, welcome to the Firefighters Podcast. How are you doing, brother? Doing great. Yeah, very <laughs> nice to uh, to be here on the show. Now, during the intro, we spoke a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today, but you join us from the beautiful world of Amsterdam, from uh, Drones for Good. How's the world ticking over there? How are you? How's the team? How's the family? Doing very well. Yeah, things are slowly opening up again here in, uh, uh, in the Netherlands, which is great. And you also see that uh, business-wise, so a lot of momentum is now happening to you it'll it'll get started again which is a uh, very exciting i think yeah. a unique thing about the, what we're discussing today is the fact that you are now looking to implement a lot of your resources a lot of your innovations a lot of your creativity and your technology to a field and a sector such as the emergency services so even through this entire crazy last two years the emergency services has has kept going anyway so what we're here talking about today is the great company drones for good that you're involved with we met earlier in the year at the emergency services show in the uk a little bit of an intro into what you guys do i mean there's so many functions now that, that drones are used for ranging from monitoring climate change um, search and rescue operations photography filming even delivering products you know we see companies like amazon when did drones for good first start get started and how did you first get involved in this sort of technology yeah great question uh, it's, it's a bit of a combination that uh, as a kid i've always been very fascinated uh, about uh, well anything that flies <laughs> actually okay. uh, still can be uh, if i'm in an airplane i'm quite excited uh, 
so I've always been thinking about uh, the, the sky and, 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 and aviation in a broader sense. But then a couple of years ago, I had a, a great party here in Amsterdam. Uh, the sun started to, to, uh, to come up already, so it was a very good party. And then uh, I met a guy on the streets, actually, and uh, he came to me. He was just walking towards music, and we started to have a little chat. And uh, I, I, I found out the guy was actually a refugee from Syria. Uh, his name was Ali, and he had been in, uh, I don't know how many tent shelter uh, in the Netherlands. And at some point, he was just so uh, done with the situation. He thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just act like I'm a backpacker. Uh, I'm going to go to Amsterdam. Uh, and when he uh, heard the music there, he just thought, well, maybe a nice party is happening there. Nice. Um, the, we got in, uh, in touch, and, uh, well, obviously, he didn't really have a place to, to stay at that time. I had a room in my house. Uh, so offered him the place, and in the end, uh, 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 he stayed there for I, guess, I think uh, one and a half years. We became really good friends. Wow, that, uh, and we still just, are. Just and, double click um, on that. Uh, that's an incredibly philanthropic effort to make. What? Why did? What connection did you make with this person? Because that I, I feel like in Amsterdam, the society is much more welcoming. I don't want to say laid back, but it does feel a bit more like you're more forgiving and more understanding of each other. I feel like in the West, we're a little bit too quick to judge each other. But even even by those standards, that's a really charitable thing to do. Why, why, why did you choose to do that? Well, I think all over the world, you'll, you'll find people that try to, to, to help. And uh, this is also a bit of the, the way I'm uh, be, being raised. Uh, um, and my mom uh, uh, literally always said to me, whenever you you can help out, you should uh, help out. One time she got extremely angry at me when I came home from school and I was uh, just telling the story that I saw a little guy on a bicycle. I think I was eight or nine years old uh, at the time and he was just walking with the bicycle. My mom said, well, did you did you stop and see how you could help? And I said, well, no, I just bicycled past him. And she became so furious at me oh. that she put me in the back of the car, drove back and she said, well, uh, you have a second chance now, uh, go help. And I oh. was a little boy crying, had no idea what to do. Being able to then go to the boy, we found out that he, um, uh, his uh, bicycle tire got flat, uh, and my mom offered uh, him a ride uh, to his place. The boy was super happy. Uh, afterwards, my mom said to me, well, so now you saw this, what would you have done differently? And I, and I said, well, mom, I don't have a car. I, I was not able to help. And then my mom said, well, the least you could do is ask the kid if he would need help. Yeah, and, and, and I forgot the situation. Creating barriers for yourself and, and accidentally going, oh, well, what, what, what can I do? You know, I think there's so much to be, have you ever seen the film Pay It Forward? No, no, no. Oh my God, make a note somewhere. I'll send it to you afterwards, right? Pay It Forward. And basically the analogy of Pay It Forward is it's done by a kid in a school and he's given an assignment that he must do a kind task, a kind thing for someone else who can never pay it back. And that's the true definition of a kind act is if like if I did you a favor, oh, I'm going to do Patrick a favor and people would be like, oh, yeah, well, that's because he, he runs a company that's something to do with emergency services. You're obviously just doing that mm. to you know help, help yourself or something like that. But doing a favor for somebody just like that, you don't even know the person, you help them out. And then the task is pay it forward. And the, the concept of the film is a good favor is done to you and you have to pay it forward to three people. Three people you either don't know or you've meet for the first time. You have to do a favor for them that they can never give back to you. And I love that 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 has just gone so global. And it, they talk about seven points of separation, that if, you know, if, the, if three people did it to so another three, to another three, to another three, it wouldn't take many repetitions until we stretch all across the globe. And I see so much of that. But do you think there's something in society now where we are discouraging people from doing those sorts of kind acts because of fear, because of, oh, I heard this story of someone that stopped to help somebody out and they got stabbed? So therefore, no one's stopping and helping anybody out now. Whereas you know, that's such a small minority and, and doing great things like that. And like, like when we come back to, to what you do, Drones for Good, Drones for Good, you know, you could do this and, and do it for Amazon or do it for somebody else and make loads and loads of money doing that way. You've chosen to do it f predominantly, you know, or a big part of what your company does is the fact you do it for the emergency services. How do we continue to ensure that people are doing these favors when it's such a scary world out there? Well, I, I think that... As human beings, we have been evolved in a way to work in smaller communities. So mm -hmm. uh, we're, let's say, up to 40, 50, maybe 100 uh, uh, people. And in this more tribal setting, uh, the way forward is being there for each other and helping out. Uh, the only way we can do that, though, is if we 
feel safety around us to do so. Otherwise, we might ind- indeed feel uh, that it, it, it might be harmful if we reach out, uh, do something out of our comfort zone. So th- the way out, I think, is that we somehow inspire each other to be able to do that. And uh, that can be done through the hard lessons, like my mom uh, uh, told me at the time. But it can also be by just seeing others in the field uh, uh, trying to help out. And uh, I think that, that that inspires a lot of people. And I see that happening now in my group of friends as well, because a lot of us are working on trying to make a positive impact in the world. And uh, it will make the perspective of the, of the others broader as well, thinking, hey, OK, but what can I do? Uh, yeah, yeah. And I think then that will become a, a very positive movement, the circle going up with. Uh, I think a lot of that hopefully, uh, has to operate yeah. on faith as well, because the, the return is not immediate. For example, you do something great. So many people will observe that, like some of the work that you're doing now, and they'll go, oh, wow, Jesus, you know, what Patrick's doing and what they're doing over there. That's really cool. But they might not reach straight out and go, hey, dude, round of applause. I love what you're doing. I think that's fantastic. But subconsciously, they'll take it in. And it may have a delayed return where for one month, two months, three months, one year later, they finally get enough inertia and enough evidence to do something good themselves. So it's not immediate. And sometimes you can do something good and then you expect everybody else to do good things to each other. And you see you see such horrible stuff in the world and you think, oh, what's the point? Everyone's horrible. But you've got to keep acting on faith and got to keep pushing forward with what you know to be the the values that that you and the team really aspire to. You're right. You're right. Uh, Although the effect when you do something good it's twofold. First of all, you have a you do have an immediate effect when uh, trying to make a positive impact because it gives you a good feeling. Uh, yes. uh, so from that perspective, it is quite egocentric as well because when you when you help out someone and you see the the, the joy, the smiles on their face, or the, the the way you were able to help out, gives a good thing. And also, and I think that is actually a very pragmatic outcome of uh, what the people in the east would would call uh, karma. But yeah, sometimes very delayed it will come back one way or, or, or the other. So many times that I uh, uh, had situations where I held out someone and then years and years later, uh, uh, our paths got crossed again or something other else happened and then it, it did come back. So yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just a beautiful way of, of living and, and, and operating. But I think that, you know, uh, to come back to the story and how we started yes, the, the drone. Sorry. Did it, but it, when I, no, 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 no. Yeah, I always love to I love go that. I go and circumnavigate the question, but we get back there. Talk to me, Ali, <laughs> Syria, in, in living with you for a year and a bit. Yeah. So we, we became good friends. And one day we sat together uh, drinking tea. And then he told me the story how he got to mainland Europe. And when he told me that story, it felt really weird because uh, I had the idea that I knew this story over and over because I had seen this in the news so many times, reading it in the newspaper, watching it on the telly. But now someone uh, that I knew very very well was telling it uh, to me uh, face to face. And he told me the story how with family and friends, they got to Turkey. They've been sold uh, a boat to cross the Mediterranean Sea and get to mainland Europe. Uh, uh, It was a a very... uh, shitty boat, a shitty equipment, uh, uh, life vest that uh, in the end uh, turned out to literally soak up the water and become even more heavy uh, um, for way, way too much money. They got on the boat, uh, tried to cross the Mediterranean Sea, got into bad weather, and they sank. And, and, uh, and Ali was one of the, uh, the only survivors of a boat Jesus. of, I think, 40 plus people. So he lost members so, of his family on the crossing as well? Yeah, yeah, he did. E- e- even uh, after the whole situation he already went through in in, during the war uh, yeah. in Syria. So that when, must have been so surreal. That, story, that must have been so surreal. I know you've already said it, to hear that story and it makes you gives you such great perspective on your own problems, doesn't it? And you're like, oh Jesus, uh, I I can't I don't feel like I can even tell you about my my my, my you know luxurious you know high end elitist problems now because when you hear what people do like that just for a better life and there's so many examples of that right. but we we need to give attention to that because we can become so so self involved, can't we? You're right, you're right, and you know here in the Netherlands sometimes you hear people talking about uh, the refugees like yeah they're trying they're, they're, they're like luck seekers trying to find happiness yeah it, it, it isn't anyone yeah on wheel indeed and and when you actually hear the situations that these people have been through then you, you do indeed feel very humble uh, uh, in, in a way that that we we tend to complain about so many little things in life whereas uh, we, we shouldn't the, the thing was what I found there the whole story touched me uh, a lot, but what made me actually 
really angry uh, was a part in me, uh, a part of me that uh, I felt kind of uh, discovered how I, how I became so immune for that type of news. Okay. Uh, and because over and over you've, you're being uh, confronted with uh, situations all over the world, but also the, I, I didn't let it in any, anymore, the feelings that come with it. And mm. now I heard it from, uh, from Ali Lair live. The next day I just could not let this happen anymore in, in, in a way. And I, and I knew, knew, well, at the time I thought, okay, we have to do something about it. And when I was already working with in, innovative uh, concepts, I got in touch with some of the rescue agencies around the Mediterranean Sea uh, working there and just called them up and asked them, okay, how can it be that uh, now for months and months in a row, we see the same images, uh, uh, videos about situations there. How come somehow uh, this cannot be stopped? And uh, they explained to me, they said, well, first of all, it's a really complex uh, political situation. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know where the, uh, the boats are. We don't uh, have the equipment to help out. We don't have the, the, the right helicopters on the right places. We don't have enough people there. So whenever these boats uh, get into trouble, we are either too late or we cannot even do a thing. Because the cost of so launching thought, okay. a helicopter out to sea is thousands, and as well as it the is, fact that the environmental impact, that you've got to put people at risk, you don't really know what, you, what you're going to, you can't afford to just redeploy it, redeploy it, redeploy it. No, 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 you, you, you're right, you, you're exactly right. It, it, it does, I think, search and rescue helicopters start on 8,500 euros an hour, I think. <laughs> it's yeah. insane price. yeah, yeah. Um, and then the whole investment comes with it. So one of my naive things uh, at that time when I was talking with these rescue organizations was saying, well, why uh, do you not use drones? Uh, you know, you see them uh, uh, flying everywhere now. Wouldn't that be an idea? And they said, well, we did some tests with them, uh, but drones, either they are military uh, drones and we, we, we cannot use them, also very, very expensive. Or we just have, well, let's say them all the con consumer grade drones, but they are able to fly 20 minutes yeah. Uh, and maybe a, a mile, uh, like, like uh, in range, and that's about it. So that's not going to help. And so I, I asked them. So, so you're unable to know where the people are, and when you do know where they are, you're unable to reach them in time. And they said, "Yeah, that's exactly the case." Uh, and I said, "Well, let's see what we can do." Uh, and <laughs> that's where that's set. where the story started. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you'd always been fascinated with flying. You say about you say about your your fascination with the sky and with aviation stuff like that. And you've given some great examples there of where you could see aspects of this technology being implemented. When was the, the first time you got a drone? Had you had ex an experience with them prior to, to the story you've just given? Or was that sort of the, the lighting the fuse that then led to this? How did the idea evolve into the company now that reaches and helps so many people? Yeah, no, I have been playing around with uh, uh, little toy drones uh, a lot, uh, uh, trying to build them myself and making them so I, I, I knew the concept. So I live near uh, Amsterdam airport. And whenever I'm here, then I, uh, I said, st I'm still amazed by the fact that we as human beings are able to fly. But I also saw how the whole ecosystem of aviation is, is becoming very uh, traditional, conservative and very polluting. And I, I love to sit with uh, uh, some of my friends and then the inner nerd in me uh, loves to brainstorm about future technology. So one of the ideas that we once came up with is like, why wouldn't you combine drones with airplanes and uh, you know make sure that they can uh, take off vertically? So if you have airplanes, they will be able to take off vertically. Maybe mm -hmm. like the old military uh, ones from the 60s and, uh, and and 70s, then you wouldn't need the runways on airports no, no, anymore. No, no. And you well, we have that out of that. Like you say, from the 60s, 1780s, yeah. even from a UK perspective, some of the jump jets and the Harriers and stuff like that were able to take exactly. off vertically. And they didn't even use um, propeller-style systems that you explained there. But I see where this technology is already out there. It's just whether or not it can become commercially viable. It's when the idea gets wide enough that the cost is able to come down. Like you say, it's, it's, it's bridging the gap between that really expensive military-style drone that can do for God knows how many hours, and we're obviously we're going to get into the detail of that, bridging the gap between that and the uh, theoretical low-level commercial hobbyist with just a 20-minute capacity on it. Exactly, and... I think that you know, when you just asked me the question, when did this all start? It, 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 you can even go back to a moment when, uh, in my childhood, I loved to uh, watch the uh, the television show, the, the Thunderbirds, yeah. uh, where uh, <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yeah, my dad uh, made me. It, my dad made me Tracy Island. He made me one out of uh, paper mache. No uh, way! Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I had it in our loft, and uh, you know, I'd have the swimming pool would come back, and Thunderbird One would would take off. Old trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
love that. I love it. Well, I, I mean, in the end, that's a bit what what we what we are doing right now. You know, we we have been building these crazy new type of aircraft that are there to 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 fly out and help. And the, the concept has been there for a while. But then, indeed, when I uh, just discovered a couple of years ago that there's such a big gap in between the large aviation and and well the, the consumer grade drones. But there's a huge potential in the middle there mm. uh, where you can actually, well, you know, fly out with new uh, aerospace technology to, to help our people. I thought, okay, this is great. So when I continued that quest for uh, first really uh, dedicated to the, the search and rescue type of operations uh, and in a later stage also for a broader first responder mm. uh, a- application. We, we we started building these things ourselves. So we just equipped a, a regular drone with four propellers with wings uh, and, and, and tried to see, okay, can we make that fly? And yeah. uh, uh, Or the other way around, a little uh, model airplane uh, with four propellers. Uh, um, how two, how uh, did that airport. trial and error process work? I, I recently finished a book. Um, a, lot, a lot of errors. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever, yeah. it's only came out a little while ago, James Dyson has released yeah. a book called Invention. Fascinating read. James Dyson and, and how the Dyson industry works, not just the cycle and technology, but everything else. That iteration, I think he did 5,000 iterations of the vacuum before he came up with the cyclone, sorry. And people wow. forget, and I love your mindset, but you have to be the constant tinkerer and the constant eternal student that welcomes failure. You know, I find a lot of engineers and, and scientists are a lot more familiar with and accepting of quote-unquote failure because they see it as part of the iterative process you know you're also an entrepreneur as well but actually I would argue most entrepreneurs are quite averse to failure having spent a time with, with quite a number of them but if they come from more of an engineering background or a technology background or a scientific background such as yourself they're happier to to do several iterations they don't take the hits as bad you know they see it as part of the process so I tell it was any stories where something dropped into the ocean dropped into the swimming pool you just lost it over the over the housing estate somewhere <laughs> oh, oh, oh mate Peter, Peter, I have so many of these questions I, I mean we we literally uh, have, have uh, thousands of iterations and every time something new filled again and filled over so y- you are right you know it, mm. it, it is about failing uh, uh, all over, all the time, but at the same time, really trying to keep your, your mission leading the way. Yeah. And then it's okay to fail. Uh, it's actually a good thing because uh, well, mm. you, you learn most from your failures. W- one of the things that I uh, <laughs> always think is a, quite a fascinating anecdote is that uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I think we built our second or third prototype in a, in a really short amount of time. And then we were invited for a, a very big aerospace uh, show in, uh, uh, in the Emirates in Dubai wow. uh, to, to show what we, uh, what we could do. We went there as a drone uh, for good company. And so we built this platform, but because we have very limited resources, very limited time, we just built one prototype with one flight controller with all the software on it, and it, it had to work. Um, we had to ship it that Sunday to Dubai uh, for that flight, but we wanted to do some last uh, test flights on uh, Saturday, uh, Saturday. Now, during Saturday, somehow we uh, got into the news in the Netherlands, and the national news came to uh, to me and wanted to film me, do an interview, uh, uh, and so on. So they did, and that would be uh, going on air on the 8 p.m. Uh, news uh, that night. Mm. At that time, we were doing test flights in a field here in in uh, just outside of Amsterdam. So we were flying there. It was winter time, uh, January, uh, extremely cold. And while at the same time, I, I was being on the television trying to show how all the amazing things we were doing and how everything was going all right, I, I was actually standing in the field watching our only uh, prototype that we had at the time doing some really weird moments, uh, <laughs> movement in the air, thinking, okay, this is not going well. It was very dark. I was there with the, the we were with a team of three. And at that moment, the, uh, the air, aircraft, well, it just got berserk. It went crazy, started flying all over. And then at some point, I just saw it <laughs> nose diving down, oh. going into a, a little lake there. Oh, and no. I just... No way, we have to ship this tomorrow. <laughs> the, the whole thing is going to start this week. What the hell am I going to do? At that time, there was a little layer of ice on the lake. So I saw the thing coming down and going in halfway through the ice. The batteries that are, are very prone to, to, to explosions if they uh, oh, get no. wet just 
sticking <laughs> above the eyes <laughs> and the flight controller, which was the most important part of the aircraft, just above that. And I, I saw this happening, uh, the lights stopped blinking, and then I saw the whole craft going <laughs> deeper and deeper through the eye. So oh. I just undressed there while running there, just jumped in, tried to break the eyes away and to just in time save the aircraft from the batteries reaching the water. Oh, uh, <laughs> I, I was there in the water holding the thing, waiting until my colleagues came and helped me out there. We could rescue the flight controller and the batteries, which were the most important part there. Uh, with a bit of hypothermia, I went back into the car uh, warming up in, in al uh, aluminium foil. And at that moment, we had only, let's say, 12 hours to make part of the, to repair parts of the aircraft. Wow. Uh, um, but at least we had the most uh, vital part and it worked out. We had it. So in the end, we were able to ship everything, fly there and uh, had a good flight uh, in, uh, in Dubai. But there was a <laughs> quite how, an intense moment. How did you get invited to, to Dubai to, uh, you know, an aerospace, uh, you know, exhibition? That's quite a uh, prestigious thing to be invited to. How long had you been in the industry? Were you already working with some, some people or some services or how did that happen? Yeah, no, not at all. We, we, we actually just started at the time. So that's why we just were in the prototyping phase. But I think we just, yeah, just mere luck and somehow we, we got picked up. I, I think it's quite interesting that if you, if you do focus on, on making a positive impact, trying to do good, then the, the, the news uh, reaches out uh, fast. And I think, uh, um, well, in, in Dubai and the Emirates, they love innovations and try to, to lure everyone to, uh, to their place, which is good. So uh, that's uh, how we ended up there, yeah. That's incredible. Now, you, made, you said something really interesting earlier because obviously you first said about the ideas of going out across the water to support rescue efforts for coast guards and people operating at sea and stuff like that. And, but I love what you said about being clear what you're, what you're trying to do. So if your mission was we need to design something that's going to be able to go out across the ocean and, and, and rescue people. And you had so many barriers with, you know, battery life and flight capacity and the size and the, the environment and weather and stuff out there. But like you say, for when I hear drones for good and when, I, when I've looked at your website and when I've read some more information about the company, your purpose is to be able to add value in so many different aspects and if that becomes your sole purpose you can already take the technology that was effectively already existing and use it in a slightly smaller scale so when you talk about search and rescue and we talk about even from our point so from the fire fire service and stuff like that a lot of the drones that are out there even back then and certainly the models that you have now could very quickly be deployed to support the emergency services on a local scale like you say going up and, and flying around an incident for 20 30 minutes capturing all those images and, and giving you that aerial view of a structure or a landscape or using your thermal imaging capacities to, to search for people if you had only made your one purpose that we need to create a craft that can fly out into the sea and, and find people that are lost at sea it could have been a much longer and potentially fatal venture that you didn't get as much reward from. So how soon into the company's sort of um, experience and sort of the company's journey did you start looking to support other emergency services with search and rescue, with uh, incidents? Well, I, I think that in, in the end, this all uh, comes back on, uh, uh, on our mission again. I just wanted to, to use the technology to, uh, to do good. And, and, and you know, the... the, the um, the type of technology that we were uh, uh, making uh, and, and that we are that we are still making can be used in so many different applications. And yeah, in, in the end, uh, I always say it in a way that we just want to be a little bit of the, the superhero in the skies. Uh, yeah. And by that, uh, being there as a support for the uh, first responders and the people in the field. And um, you can do that in so many different aspects. So, uh, at some point when we found that building these search and rescue uh, aircraft was quite challenging, uh, especially because you need them during uh, bad weather uh, circumstances a lot. Uh, regulation in Europe at the time uh, wasn't really helping uh, uh, either. So then we went to Africa and we started to fly in uh, in a couple of various uh, African countries where, where the regulation was way easier because it was simply just uh, way less populated. Mm. And uh, um, Again, there, there's always things you can do. So there in the national parks, uh, they had the same problem. They wanted to uh, uh, support their wildlife against poachers. Poachers. Um, they ha did not have money for airplanes or helicopters and the drones don't fly uh, uh, far enough. So yeah, yeah, can we help out? Sure, we can. So then we started working together with them. And then uh, at some point, 
one of the, the rangers asked me, uh, you know, would you guys also be able to transport uh, little doses of anti-venom uh, for yeah. snake bites? Yeah. Uh, because uh, our rangers get uh, bitten quite often by snakes, and whenever that happens, they need, need to go back to find a hospital within 20 or 30 minutes. And we said, well, you know, well, we are able to fly out uh, that far. Why not? We'll see. So uh, uh, the, our uh, engineers started to think if we can, we could create a little uh, fridge um, yeah. uh, inside the aircraft to keep the uh, the anti venom in between certain um, uh, degrees uh, Celsius of uh, like in, in temperature range, and we were able to do so. And then suddenly a whole new world popped up from NGOs asking if we would be able to transport medicine to remotely uh, located areas, and then. We, of course, had the, 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 the whole firefighting team that said, well, when you're able to fly out that far, you might be able to support during wildfire. So there's, a, there's heaps of applications that can be done with the technology. So, so take me back, because that, that all just sounds absolutely fascinating. And I want to I de-chunk that bit by bit. So firstly, getting invited out to Africa is, is one thing. Deciding to actually go is a whole new <laughs> thing, you know. So, I mean, you, you clearly don't have that fear of just picking up and, and going. I mean, how long were you out there for? Where specifically, you said you worked on some national parks. Did you yourself, as in, were the, did the team pilot some of the drones and did you manage to see, you know, some of the poachers at work and we and how to what capacity were you able to, to put that into practice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we went there um, and we we worked in, in, in various Afri- African countries, um, we did a lot of testing in um, in, in South Africa uh, uh, where we uh, where we started out, and we indeed, indeed soon found that the technology is great to to get to uh, remote places with thermal cameras, uh, regular cameras. We were able to find where the wildlife is, uh, uh, and we uh, could also develop on trying to find poachers whenever they would get into the park. You must have had um, some amazing footage. I mean, just just to create that footage oh, yeah. with drones. I mean, if you if you put half that footage on YouTube, I bet you've just got millions of hits just from <laughs> tracking wildlife. I mean, that's a business in itself. You must have seen some amazing stuff. No, you're right. You're right. Well, normally you're uh, obviously not allowed to fly with drones there, yeah. um, but, but we were. So it, it, indeed, with this great high definition cameras, uh, we were able to get amazing footage there. Wow. So uh, it's uh, been. Than the National Geographic, uh, I yeah. think sometimes. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, <I'm> yeah. <laughs> new business model. Yeah, why not? It's the sort of stuff that um, that some of the natural, uh, like say Natural Geographic, they'd be jealous of some of that footage because they spend months and months out there, you know, trying to use their antiquated ways to try and get that footage. And you guys, God, I bet it's beautiful. I'm gonna have to go over. Have you have you got all of that on on a YouTube channel somewhere? Because I'll I'll put it in the notes. And don't, if you haven't, dude, you need to release it. You haven't even got to glorify it. Just just put some some bits out there because your footage must be incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think we have a lot on the on our YouTube channel, but I'll think about it. That's a good, uh, that's a good one. It would be great, great. To, just to, to see show. the power of, yeah. of what you guys do and the places that you've been, because the work you do is amazing. You know, I just feel like we need to scream about it. But so you were able to develop a small compartment within the drones that could facilitate a, a small vaccination. How far could the drones fly at that point? How what, what sort of distances were you able to achieve? I think at that time we had around 50 to 60 kilometers. Uh, kilometers? Like that. Uh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was, there was enough at that time. And uh, obviously we wanted to be able to increase that, that range. Uh, and, and we did over the years. Uh, but it was already quite something. We, we, we did uh, face a lot of challenges being able to fly there in Africa because uh, the African environment uh, it can be very harsh. We're talking about Tilius. Um, uh, one time we um, uh, built this magnificent uh, new aircraft that we were super proud of for flight in Africa and tested it uh, thoroughly here. At some point, we uh, we went there, started flying, and uh, after a couple of flights, we just left it there. We came uh, uh, back out after a cup of coffee, and then we, we saw that the aircraft started morphing, literally. So the, so the whole shape started <laughs> to become different. Wow. Uh, part of the foam became almost like popcorn. We were like, what the hell is happening here? Uh, and, and we found that the internal temperature uh, reached up to, I think, 95 uh, degrees or something. Whoa. And then we, we found that although you can, uh, it's, it's not, not a problem at all to make part of your aircraft painted black in the Netherlands. It's not a great <laughs> idea in the African sun. Uh, <laughs> 
yeah, stupid mistake. But uh, did you, yeah, did you ever learn. encounter any problems? Because it's, so, like in the UK, if somebody flies a drone across uh, somebody's private land, you, they can get shot down. Some people shoot at them to knock them out of the mm. sky just because they don't like them. They feel like somebody's spying on them or whatever. Was that ever a fear, or did you ever experience it? With, I mean, in any places that you've you've traveled or even certainly in in the poacher analogy if a poacher saw a, a drone and they're familiar with what you're doing you know if i was a poacher i'd be shooting it out of the sky well f- first of all um good luck trying to hit it because uh, <laughs> when we fly uh, we can fly up to cruise speeds of uh, uh, more than uh, 100 uh, kilometers an hour um, uh, we we fly on an altitude of around 120 meters so it would be about say 400 feet um, so, so it's not that easy to actually well, hit, hit, hit the aircraft. Um, but I think more important for us is that we always, before we start a mission somewhere, uh, we try to make sure that we get in touch with um, uh, the, the locals there. So they understand and that we uh, can explain and that we, that we uh, you know, get a bit of public uh, acceptance because that is that is uh, extremely important for the things that um, that yeah. we do. I, I know. Uh, so, so when I told my parents back in the days that I'm going to do something with drones, what is your feeling when I say the word drone? And I think my mom uh, uh, started uh, uh, talking about the the, 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 the bomber drones uh, of the the U.S. Army, and and my dad as uh, his first thoughts were the very annoying. Uh, privacy infringing uh, uh, little drones flying on a beach, mm. and I thought, okay, well, that's not that's not great uh, because we try to do uh, use this technology yeah. to do something good. So, um, we started to think a lot about how can we make sure that we can introduce uh, uh, this new technology in in a, in a positive way, yeah. uh, and it is very important that you that that you do that in a very close collaboration with the people that will see these aircraft flying over. So yeah. one of the things, for example is that we even thought of the, the, the uh, maybe for some people, minor detail, but very important for us, um, the, the looks of our logo, uh, the, the way we uh, shape the design of the aircraft is all, it's all very round. Uh, we wanted everything to be to look very friendly instead of uh, being super racy or uh, 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 carbon uh, uh, fiber composite, whatever. Um, so in all the little details, we try to think, uh, what do people uh, think of it here? And, and, and I remember one mission we had in Africa. Uh, I think there was a time when we had the, a part of the aircraft uh, uh, literally in the carbon fiber racy look. And uh, the local uh, tribe there literally thought it was some kind of black magic. And they didn't <laughs> like it at all. Uh, understandable. Uh, we came back later uh, with a, a white aircraft uh, with a red cross on it. And everyone understood, okay, so this is here to help. Yeah. So, yeah, it is a super important part of our work. Mm. Y- okay. You make several great points there. I just wanted to come back to the height just for a second, because like you said about mm. trying to hit something, 120 meters. So just for, for, yeah. for people's understanding, that's a 40-story building. That's 40 floors high. That is, yeah. you, 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 I mean, you wouldn't know it's there. You'd have no clue. You couldn't even hear it you would have absolutely no clue. Can it actually capture usable footage from that height? Yeah, great footage. Yeah, yeah. The, so, so the cameras that really? we use there... From, from uh, are, 120 uh, meters? Uh, wow. E- easily, easily. Yeah, yeah. Oh my uh, that, God. that works great. And <laughs> <laughs> the, the good thing about flying at that altitude is that uh, indeed you you are kind of traceless. So uh, the people don't hear you fly over, uh, especially when you fly wingborne. Uh, um, so uh, having a horizontal flight, uh, because the whole aircraft is electric, uh, it doesn't make uh, uh, that much noise. So people on the, uh, on the, on the underground, they uh, wouldn't even notice. But from that altitude, uh, you're far away from uh, tall buildings uh, or other elevated parts of nature. And uh, yeah, we, we just have very high definition cameras on board uh, mm. with, uh, with great zoom and, and a lot of stabilizing technology mm. for the footage and the imagery. So you, you indeed have a very, very high resolution of the material. That's incredible. I mean, as you were talking there, there's just there's so many things that, that go through my head in terms of so many applications. There's just so many applications. You must just be like a, you know, a kid in a toy shop when you're looking around at all of the problems people are facing. I mean, I even think of, of like just general agriculture you know the amount of time people spend driving around their land in their vehicles trying to check fences trying to check livestock trying to check all this sort of stuff and and i know there's there's um companies across the world and certainly i can think of a few in the uk who are now using drones 
to simply they, they hire a pilot and buy a drone and that person will fly across the land two or three times a week and check everything and they can they can do it from the comfort of the the head office do you know what i mean they haven't got to have that huge environmental impact uh, and everything like that so back to back to the emergency sorry go on yeah well the interesting thing there is because you're right you know that there are so many potential applications and like literally every week we get a request from uh, people all over the world coming up with new applications that i haven't heard uh, before it's 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 immense but that's also challenging because um it requires us to really calculate through what is the the so where are we going to focus and what do we have for now because you can you can do anything, but you cannot do everything. No, you can um, do everything badly, uh, or you can do one or two things very well. Exactly. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, so what we try to do is per application, uh, literally index and calculate what is the uh, the impact that we can make, and and that's how we focus. So we try to find out okay geographically uh, or per use case or application where can we make uh, the most positive impact in the, the the soonest period of time from mm. from now, and that's uh, uh, how we choose. Mm. Um, and uh, I think that in a, in a couple of years uh, we uh, we will see this technology being used for way more potential applications uh, in, in in everyday life uh, mm. used way more. But yeah, first things first. So, what are the the key sort of uh, projects or strategies that the company is working on currently? Where are you seeing the greatest return on investment of of your time, your resources, and like you say, I mean, it's called drones for good. Where are you feeling like you're making the biggest impact? So I think currently, uh, and that also has to do with the current set of regulation, which is unfortunately here and there still a bit on the conservative side, uh, making it very complex to fly over densely populated areas, uh, mm-hmm. urban environments and so on. Just just to expand um, on that, sorry, before you carry on, because we've said yeah. regulation a few times. I'm not familiar with the regulations as in, I, I don't, yeah, I don't please, own a drone. Keep it that way. It's very bore, boring work. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me the, the highlights of how much they are, I say they, um, governments, aviation societies, organizations, how much are they putting up barriers and how much logic do you actually see in some of these barriers? What are you and are you not allowed to do as a commercial company providing drones for, for, for use? Let, let's say now it, it's already, it has improved a lot, although uh, uh, still uh, sometimes it feels very uh, unlogical. In the beginning, when we had to file for permission to fly, uh, we had to um, work uh, according to a standard framework of regulations, including uh, how we were talking about our uh, kerosene, uh, about our pilots on board, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, well, we were flying electric. We don't. Yeah. We don't have <laughs> so they're, they're just said, taking. Well, we cannot- yeah, they're taking the current <laughs> thing of a of a and of an aviation thing with a pilot and passengers, large fuel deposits on board. They're just trying to copy and paste that to this new technology, yeah. which is similar but in a completely different thing, really. Exactly. And then uh, when we uh, after after a lot of. Uh, time spending doing these applications, we got a call uh, by the uh, by the uh, the ministry uh, asking us. So, are you in helicopter or are you uh, a fixed wing airplane? And I said, well, yeah, we're both. And they said, well, uh, we don't have a box that we can pick for that, so you have to choose. <laughs> I said, well, yeah. Can you not make a new box then? And they said, nah, that will take a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, yeah. All right, well, <laughs> you pick one then. Okay. Um, so, so, so that that, that took uh, took a while, and I think I, I understand uh, obviously that when you make uh, when you innovate and when you develop new technology, especially when we uh, uh, when we talk about the the aviation environment, that it should be super uh, safe, uh, super reliable, yeah. uh, and that you want to know exactly what we work with. Mm-hmm. But the thing is that there's just many unknowns here that are sometimes very hard for regulators because we have the current airspace being uh, being used also a lot by sport airplanes, hot air balloons, uh, yeah, and yeah, so on. Yeah. So uh, how are you going to work with new technology and these other air users uh, at the same time? Um, uh, how are you going to calculate the potential risk and what is okay there? Here in the Western world, we apparently we find it okay that we have uh, literally hundreds of lethal accidents in traffic 
uh, yeah. every year uh, here in the Netherlands uh, uh, on bicycles, uh, uh, car accidents, and so on. So apparently that's okay. But uh, if you want to introduce a new technology, uh, then they want zero accidents to happen. Yeah. Uh, obviously. So so how are you gonna move toward that? So that 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 was that is and and was quite complex because we can do a risk assessment, uh, but we can. It would be childish to say that that the that, that, that there is a zero chance of something yeah. happening because that's I think the, one of the big concerns as well is you say about car accidents, you know, with bikes, vehicles, lorries, whatever. We have a an infrastructure that we are both familiar with, and that also when it goes wrong, we feel like we can have an effective combat to it. You know, we have an effective return and resources that will support that emergency incident when it occurs. When you then take that stuff into the air, we just don't have the ability at the moment to effectively police it that is something that i think really scares people because also with any great innovation with any great technology there also comes the people that will take that technology for dangerous and uh, and scary means you know that's strapping an improvised explosive device to a drone and then you can you can go anywhere and you can launch it from anywhere you know historically yeah. aircraft would go to an airport to take off Anything that's in the air, they've come from a registered site. Or if they haven't, it's usually something so so irrelevant. I'm saying this from a completely uneducated perspective, but like a balloon. You could you could put up a hot air balloon. It's not going to move very quickly. If it is a threat, it's not going to get away from anything very fast. You can intercept it and, uh, and mitigate that risk quite quickly. But a drone is so agile. It, the technology is so accessible. So I'm, I'm not justifying their thoughts and beliefs, but I can appreciate why they are so scared of because mm-hmm. i think it is fear and i don't know if you i don't know if you feel the same it's a fear of oh god if we let if we let this out of the box we can't put it back in the box do you know does that make sense yeah yeah well I, you're right i mean you can use uh, technology in, in both ways and uh, I, I think it's also our obligation uh, also for me personally to really think through what is the actual impact uh, also the negative impact that we make with this technology and how do we protect uh, it's from uh, being used in a bad way. At the same time, what you see quite often is that political systems, they try to use regulation to make sure that the bad people are, uh, don't do the bad things. Yeah. Uh, the thing is that uh, th- these people will not even think about regulation because they're going to do it they anyway. Don't care. Yeah. So, <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're not going to go on to Gov UK and go, before we just launch our terrorist attack, let's just make sure we're following the rules. Okay, that's not, that's not part of their strategic meeting. They really don't care. They're going to do it anyway. That's the very nature of them. So all you're actually doing most of the time is creating barriers for companies that are trying to make a, different, a positive difference in the world. You're, you're right, you're right. And that's the thing that you're like, in these types of situations, policies to prevent bad things from happening are actually preventing 99.9% of people and companies that try to do good things yep. from getting closer to their goal. And I think that's something that we should solve if we want to be able to help out these impactful applications. Yeah. Absolutely. So take me back. Sorry, I interrupted you several times. It's a terrible, I just get so excited and I, 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 I forget things so fast. So I just spit them out. It's a terrible habit of mine. Applications. Can you record everything then? I know. Yeah. Crikey. <laughs> um, so we've spoken about uh, working with nature reserves. We spoke about um, some of the applications overseas. Expand for me on the other aspects that you're currently um, applying this technology to for, from that emergency services perspective. Who are you working with? Where where have you put in place contracts or where have organizations or services made purchases and where, where is it currently being used? Yeah, so uh, um, it is at the moment uh, quite hard to fly over uh, uh, urban areas. Um, uh, there lies uh, a lot of potential in flying uh, over nature areas or simply less uh, uh, densely populated um, uh, uh, regions. So that means that uh, two uh, very interesting applications open up, uh, where one is wildfire fighting. Obviously, uh, the world uh, uh, faces a lot of challenges uh, there simply due uh, to uh, draw uh, uh, climate warming and the fact that in, in many uh, areas, uh, well, we've seen it last year, you know, in the, in, in the southern part of Europe, yeah. uh, even huge areas uh, of land got de- destroyed. Uh, in these type of areas that are usually so big, uh, so it's very hard to keep everything inside or keep track of uh, everything happening here and there, then it's a great way uh, to use uh, that technology to support mm-hmm. firefighters. And that can be done uh, 
uh, in a preventive way. So during warm uh, or hot days uh, in, in, the, in the drier uh, season, using these aircraft to, to patrol, uh, uh, using uh, heat cameras, thermal cameras, uh, or regular cameras with uh, AI uh, being able to detect smoke in a very uh, early phase of a fire uh, can help uh, help a lot. How does it detect um, smoke? Sorry, how does it? Obviously, heat rises, and there'll be a, there'll be a thermal um, rising layer that they can pick up. But what 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 are the technology is? And is it just the, the thermal imaging cameras, or how does it pick up smoke specifically? Sorry. Yeah, so we so we use a camera system that has a thermal sensor uh, as well as um, a regular uh, RGB uh, uh, video sensor, and we can fuse these uh, uh, images. Uh, then we have algorithms that we can train to detect uh, fire in a very early stage. And sometimes we can indeed use uh, trying to find out heat sources there. But in, in many, we, we just simply found that when we fly uh, with the aircraft and we have the camera on an angle, so we don't look at it, uh, the situation top down, but uh, more uh, like a bird view looking forward, we have a way broader uh, perspective so we can simply see more. Yeah. Uh, and we found that the algorithms are able to detect even very, very tiny smoke columns or, or pillars way quicker than any infrared or thermal yeah. uh, sensory information. So, uh, yeah, we train the algorithms to become better at it. Uh, that requires some manual uh, uh, work in the beginning but after a while the algorithm is trained well enough and it can do that automatically during a flight Love and whenever it, it sees or it detects something that's usually smoke then uh, a trained flight operator or uh, a first responder can have a look at it uh, double check and it automatically then calculates the location gps coordinates and uh, will broadca broadcast it to any um, uh, first responding uh, organization in the field that's great so, I mean, we've given examples there: wildfires and um, things in low, low, low densely, low densely populated environments. Surely, is there not a loophole in the regulation in terms of heavily populated or densely populated areas that the fact that it's the emergency services, i.e., it's the police looking for somebody that's lost, or it's the police looking for somebody who's committed a crime, or it's the fire service responding to a factory in the middle of a heavily populated area. Are they not allowed to use them there then? Are the regulations that restrictive that we can't fly over public housing? Or do, surely the emergency services get an exception there? Yeah, you, you would say, um, and, 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 and we might go there. The, the, the airspace uh, has always been extremely heavily regulated. And in that uh, uh, sense, um, uh, there were some uh, exceptions being made for military users. So the defense uh, a part of the government, uh, they can take over airspace. Uh, emergency services, uh, uh, not necessarily. Now, though, uh, there is a new European regulation, and with that new European regulation, uh, uh, UK, Switzerland uh, uh, are joining as well. There is an exemption for state aircraft, meaning that indeed, uh, if the aircraft has been used uh, uh, by the state for emergency services in maybe uh, an application where there's a lot of opportunity uh, or there's crisis or uh, the use has been, is being very urgent and critical, then exemptions can be made uh, uh, as well. The thing is that you have to know exactly what the risk of the mission is to uh, set it up against the opportunity that you have. Yeah. Uh, and to give a, a great example here is if uh, people, uh, if, if humans get a heart attack, then we know that if we use CPD or like if, if, if we would just try to save these people, a bystander trying to help out without technology, the chances of surviving are, are, are quite yeah. slim. Yeah. If we have an uh, electronic device, AED, defibrillator, uh, uh, whatever, yeah. then the chances of surviving increase uh, until 90%. Significant. Um, if being, it, yeah, it, it is <laughs> significantly. If uh, applied within six minutes. So if we would have uh, the ability to fly to two people in need with that uh, uh, technology, we, we can simply calculate how many lives we can save. Yeah. We also know what the risk is that the aircraft comes down. So this is actually one of the things that we're currently trying to find out. Do we as a company not have the obligation to break the law by, save, by, by knowing that we can save people yeah. and, and doing less people harm? Yeah, because like you said, every, every single successful flight you undertake adds more data to the fact that the likelihood of you losing a drone or a drone coming down and, and colliding and injure somebody, it's got to be minute. I mean, do, do you have a percentage of flights that are, are uh, that you fail at? It must be very low. Do you, do you know that number? Well, it, it's extremely, extremely small. Uh, we, do, we do have these numbers, but they differ 
per application. I mean, the whole aircraft has been built up in a way with so many redundant uh, uh, parts of technology. So if this component fails, we have uh, uh, many, many other components that can uh, that will automatically be uh, used as a backup system. Yeah. So, and equally, um, if it does the, fail to a certain extent, I imagine it will just safely take itself to the ground. It will get to a point where it won't try to continue going at the risk of colliding. It will say, look, we can't continue to make safe progress, so we're just going to ground right here, using its camera to ensure there's nothing below it, and safely make a landing. It's not going to keep trying to go forward and, and risk colliding with something. You're right. You're very right. Uh, it, it, it's even uh, that way that uh, our mission planning uh, is able, whenever we set out uh, a route, uh, to allocate certain uh, rally points uh, uh, during uh, the whole uh, uh, flight trajectory. So whenever something happens uh, and we lose all connections, uh, um, we use uh, propulsion uh, power or whatever uh, 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 problems we have, the aircraft will simply maneuver to the nearest predefined uh, uh, yeah. safe uh, rally point where we know that people cannot get uh, too easily. Also makes uh, it easier um, for you to find uh, it as well. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> well, we always have a, have a, have a tracer on board, so, yeah. we, so uh, that is a standalone tracer, we know where it is, but yeah, that's, that's how it works. So in that sense, we can fly in, in an extremely safe way. Yeah. yeah. So can they fly in the rain, is a question I was yeah. thinking. Yeah. I, I didn't know whether, yeah. I did, you know, what, what extreme, can it fly in the rain? To what extent can it fly in the wind? You know, is there a certain knots or, or speed of wind direction that it can't, that it can't continue to fly in? Yeah, so we, um, I, th I think that's where a lot of effort uh, uh, went into uh, the last uh, uh, two to three years uh, from our side. So we, we saw that by, um, you know, we talked about uh, various new use cases uh, uh, that we could try to chip into. But uh, we said what we uh, would love to do uh, and we think is way more important is now to uh, iterate, uh, innovate this uh, uh, technology to be able to fly uh, with, uh, in a way, larger window, uh, meaning that we want to be able to fly uh, um, uh, uh, at, at night time in heavy wind conditions, heavy rain conditions, uh, more type of circumstances, uh, 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 freezing conditions, uh, uh, and, and so on. So that's what we did, and uh, we've been doing a, a lot of tests and redesigns uh, uh, of our aircraft uh, to be able to do that. And we wanted, uh, we designed everything to be able to fly in, 92 to 95 percent uh, of all uh, weather conditions, uh, uh, and that's what we do. So th th there's still, you know, sometimes there uh, uh, are uh, when you have an extreme storm, uh, um, yeah. uh, we are unable to to fly there uh, currently. Um, but uh, due to a lot of um, uh, smart um, aerodynamical uh, design changes and a lot of software uh, uh, updates. Uh, we were able to withstand um, way higher uh, uh, winds, um, mm. uh, which is great because what you see in the emergency services is that uh, in many applications, especially when, we, when you talk about uh, offshore uh, use of the aircraft, we're talking about uh, bad weather uh, yeah. uh, conditions. Yeah. And yeah. even so when you say, right. so when you say these have limitations, these are limitations that would actually apply to most standard operations anyway. These aren't like, oh, it's a little bit windy outside and they won't be able to fly in this sort of weather. We're talking really exceptional weather conditions that actually we probably wouldn't be carrying out a rescue anyway. And I imagine it probably falls in alignment with a lot of other aircraft can't fly in the same situation so it's not like there the technology is a lesser standard than everything else that's in that's in the air the, if, it, if it can't fly it's because it's very severe very severe weather and storms that you're that you're experiencing you're right you're right and well and actually um because uh, we use uh, aircraft that are unmanned we're able to to fly in in, in even higher uh, or, or, yeah. or well more extreme conditions than helicopters or airplanes for example because the then you have pilots on board. the risk is lower um how long, how long do they last now? Because you spoke right at the beginning about, you know, 20-minute life capabilities of these original drones. The fact that you can fly 60 kilometers would suggest they're going to... How long do they last now? Yeah, I think so. So, so now the range is uh, uh, over 100 uh, uh, kilometers uh, that Jesus. we can fly. Um, uh, our new, new aircraft um, has a range, depending a bit on the payload that we take, but um, uh, in between one and one and a half hour uh, flights, 
uh, that we do, um, uh, which is uh, which is great uh, and, and 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 usually way enough for uh, for most of the application. So what we do is we we, we take off and we do that vertically. Um, uh, that costs a bit of energy, but as soon as we transition into a forward wing borne flight, uh, you become uh, uh, super efficient. And whenever we are at an incident or location uh, where we want to be, we go into a loiter. Um, and uh, uh, try to go around saving as much energy as we can. Uh, when you really have to uh, um, hang still in the air, you can go back to Hoover mode again. Yeah. Uh, uh, but again, that will uh, uh, cost a bit more energy. Um, and that way we'll stay at the situation as long as we can. And when we uh, uh, send or when the aircraft sends that the batteries run out, uh, uh, it can fly backwards. Uh, and when required, there can be a second aircraft already at the situation uh, mm. to take over. Yeah. Um, uh, probably yeah. a very uh, simplistic question but I'm just having my head in the minds of people that will be listening and are considering getting something like this for their service I am imagine the batteries are just plug in plug out you can just stick another one in straight away and you can have a bank of them would I be right in saying that or do you have to recharge the entire craft or can you just switch them out yeah no you just uh, switch them out it takes you a couple of seconds you can also you can also charge the whole aircraft if you want and that's especially uh, what, we, what we what we found is that the most impact you can make uh, in a situation is if you're able to fly out before uh, the uh, first responders are even at the scene. Mm. Uh, uh, so um, uh, to be able to do that, we wanted the aircraft to be uh, at standby uh, uh, during the whole time. Yeah. Uh, so we developed a docking station, uh, like a launch station where the aircraft is in, uh, uh, where it is uh, uh, charged. And um, at the moment, uh, uh, we know the location of an incident. Uh, the docking station opens up. Then this becomes literally the Thunderbird. I still want to build a little swimming pool and palm trees on it. To make oh, it look man, cool, you'll do it. You'll do it. I know you will. As soon as you're allowed to have one manned, I bet you've got one that you can sit on already. You just haven't told anybody. <laughs> you can just take it straight out of your backyard and you'll be popping anywhere you like. Exactly. Well, yeah, you, you get you get everywhere quick. Next next time you're here, then uh, we'll show you. <laughs> yeah, so we're still yeah. working on something. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, then, you know, you know the, the the cool thing there is that um, when you're able to uh, deploy uh, at that quick, um, uh, you're at a situation way earlier, uh, and, and you just can make a, a, a better. Uh, well, you have way better situational awareness uh, yeah. uh, of the situation, helping uh, uh, helping. Um, all the results become better. And uh, to be able to do that, we wanted the aircraft to be able to charge uh, uh, um, after flight again in, uh, in, the, in the docking station. So that's something that we've been uh, uh, working on. And um, yeah, because of that, you don't need people to, to go out, uh, put the aircraft out, change batteries, and so on, that all happens automatically. Done. Yeah, and that echoes back to the examples of delivering vaccines. And also, I was thinking when you were talking about um, defibrillators and stuff like that, so, so two questions. You said about payload. What is the current payload? Because before our conversation, we spoke briefly about the future of the emergency services and how I, I recently had a guest on who spoke about delivering equipment to site and how they they feel that drones will, will have the capacity to deliver pieces of equipment but then my mind also goes to like um, i'm up in the lake district uh, next week just uh, this is a, it's a mountain range in the uk and climbers you know they get into trouble and like you said about somebody that experiences a heart attack or something like that the ability to have something sat in us in a charging port could immediately take off with a defibrillator and be at that individual in you know, a couple of minutes. What is the payload they can currently carry? And is uh, I'm imagining those are sort of applications we're looking at. Yeah, so uh, current payload of the new aircraft uh, lies in between three and five kilograms. So it will be uh, uh, six to 10 pounds uh, uh, with quite a lot of uh, uh, volume. So that will be well sufficient for uh, uh, carrying the fibrillators, uh, um, any urgently required medical uh, mm. goods like a uh, um, uh, you know, sometimes when you need blood or uh, emergency kits, there will be a, a, a well sufficient uh, um, uh, there. Mm. Um, I, I think that we'll see the next couple of years uh, these aircraft, uh, uh, well, scale uh, to to carry larger uh, uh, payloads, uh, both weight wise and volume wise, um, to be able to support first responders uh, mm. uh, 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 even more. We see that um, this way. Uh, 
especially for the most applications that we fly now, uh, it, 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 it well, uh, it, it's well sufficient uh, mm. for yeah, 90 plus percent of all flights. Is that just a case of size of the aircraft? in terms of what it's capable of, of carrying? Because some of your aircrafts, one, the one that you had at the emergency services show, what was that called? Because that was, I mean, you could fit it in the boot of a 4 by 4 vehicle, but you've got to strike the balance between something that can be taken to incidents or taken to locations and be deployed from there, um, but also wanting it large enough to be able to facilitate all of the, all of the abilities you said there about the height, about the 100 you know, kilometer distances and all that sort of stuff. How big are these drones now? Yeah. Yeah, so um, they're, they're getting bigger. Uh, so the the, the wingspan uh, is uh, two to two uh, 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 and a half meters. Um, wow. So so that would be six uh, uh, feet up. And uh, I think that from you know uh, a little theory class here in in in, in, in aerodynamical design. The, the, the thing it. is uh, within uh, uh, nature, the 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 heavier uh, uh, your aircraft is. Um, exponentially more uh, wing surface is required. Yeah. So you have to be, become exponentially larger. Um, that is very uh, uh, inefficient. That's also the reason why if you look in nature at uh, evolution, you'll see that many flying things are have become a lot smaller. Mm. Uh, um, all the, the flying dinosaurs that we uh, we saw in Jurassic Park uh, are not around anymore. And that's, uh, that's for a reason. Uh, birds are becoming a lot smaller either because it is uh, increasingly uh, more efficient to, to, to be smaller. Mm. Now, now, we are doing almost the opposite because we want to be able to fly out also with... Um, um, heavy duty uh, material, yeah. um, meaning that every time we have to uh, come up with technology that is exponentially more efficient um, uh, because we cannot increase uh, the, uh, our wingspan and propellers uh, infinitely because then we cannot uh, transport the aircraft uh, uh, itself anymore. So we have to uh, try to find the, the, the right balance in between these two uh, things. Um, because of that, we also decided to to develop the aircraft in such a way that it's quite modular, uh, so you can uh, simply just click off the wings, uh, 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 click them back on uh, for transportation, um, and that works. Uh, um, but also, uh, I think that the next couple of years you will see that uh, these aircraft do not to be transported anymore uh, in cars because they, they they transport themselves. They are just located uh, uh, in these docking stations. Uh, at centrally uh, uh, located uh, uh, areas uh, where they can fly out to any situation within minutes, uh, just covering a certain range uh, within uh, geographic uh, uh, area where they can uh, uh, deliver help. Now, just to just to add sort of weight to the argument of how much these make an environmental. Uh, impact versus some of the alternatives that we use and even if we're just traveling by land you know the amount of toxic gases we're throwing into i know this is a very obvious question for you but i'm kind of put my head in the my mind in the head of people that are listening these are fully electric you know drones so in terms of environmental impact with the exception of the noise which again because they're electric is very small am i right in saying there's effectively zero pollution involved in these yeah you're right yeah yeah uh, 100% during operations, uh, uh, zero pollution, um, uh, the energy being used uh, uh, to power the flights and charge the battery um, uh, is obviously green energy. Um, uh, that's how we, uh, how we work. Um, part of the production, um, we try to uh, make that more sustainable uh, as well. So together with our suppliers, we're trying to find the most uh, um uh, well, uh, let's say the, the best way uh, to reduce uh, uh, carbon uh, emissions uh, also. Mm. Um, what, what a lot of people do not know is that um, both helicopters and airplanes uh, not only produce uh, carbon, uh, but al also nitrous oxide, uh, yeah. uh, a lot of fine dust particles. Mm. And uh, uh, somehow it became a big trend to talk about uh, carbon reduction yeah. uh, um, but, but but we tend to forget all the other things that are actually uh, way worse. Yeah, yeah. Um, so but by being able to uh, well to look at it from a more holistic perspective in that sense and trying to have uh, 
to, to look at the technology from the moment you start producing something until uh, uh, the end of operations. Uh, the whole life cycle, seeing, okay, what is the effect, not just the carbon, uh, but any other uh, thing that I think is super important for technology like this. Mm. But, uh, yeah, compared to uh, what we currently use, it's already a massive, massive difference. Yeah, it, it really is hard for anybody to stand in opposition of those glaring facts. Because like you say, even in the development of the technology, people just look at the impact of the end product, of which there's actually significant reduction in what you do anyway but even if you just look in the 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 life cycle of the product in in coming to its uh coming to its existence we create so much um toxic environmental impact creating a lot of these other forms of transport let alone the impact the end product makes on the environment and yours seems to circumnavigate so so many of those but i imagine it's not very it's not a very popular fact um when you're um working uh, i say in competition not really but it's it's an alternative so the idea of it being an alternative suggests that it must be in competition with with older um aspects of, of transporting things and, and getting that information it must be hard to sing the praises of this do you find that um people are still nervous about it when you're communicating it you're doing i mean the company's called drones for good you guys are doing it for a lot of with the greatest respect to amazon you're not doing it for a massive commercial return there is obviously the company needs to make money um but are you still seeing a lot of pushback or is the tide turning to the point that people are becoming more accepting of the technology yeah i i think so and and you know, we do not necessarily see ourselves as the the, the only alternative uh, 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 to what we currently do. You can also uh, work in parallel with current uh, uh, solutions, and you should, uh, because you cannot stop all the operations we currently do that might not be uh, uh, perfect for uh, the environmental climate. So mm. uh, we try to introduce uh, our technology, and with AV, we, we, we try to see, okay, can we, are we able uh, uh, to make a contribution, um, um, maybe uh, even in, in a small part of uh, the working field of our clients, um, and, and th from there, uh, uh, together, uh, explore, okay, how can it be used more, uh, more broadly? And what you definitely see is that um, there is a, a whole shift in, in, in paradigm happening where uh, people uh, and organizations uh, do really care about the the actual impact and not, not not just the positive impact but also try to find out okay so a part of a or, or next to um the cost price and and and, and these type of variables what uh, uh how did, is it actually gonna uh, benefit society yeah. um um and what is it gonna cost on the long term um, we we get questions as well. Uh, so what uh, what are you going to do with the product after uh, its lifetime? Uh, you're going to just uh, throw it away. You're going to recycle it. What are you going to do with that? And I think that's a very uh, good thing because it, it challenges uh, uh, it challenges us as a company uh, to to think broader. And I think uh, we uh, as human beings, but also uh, uh, all the people working in 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 the supply chains. Uh, uh, have uh, the obligation to think about these things and, and, yeah. and question each other uh, what is the ultimate impact i think i absolutely think you're right um i think it's a fair question i would ask how many people are asking the same questions of people that produce a lot of the vehicles and things that we see and and you know i don't think anybody is asking the question what you're going to do with it when we finish with it because a lot of the chemicals and a lot of the fluids and a lot of the carcinogens that come out of those um, current forms of technology a lot of people say so it's it's a valuable question and the problem is we already have lots of ways that we sustainably recycle plastic so the the argument is probably fairly redundant but it's worth asking and it, it's great that you guys are putting the thought into that technology you did make a great reference and i feel i would be remiss if i didn't ask the question for people that are looking at utilizing this technology more how much does it cost <laughs> if a service or an organization thought you know what i've listened to patrick and i'm, I'm just bowled over by how um, deployable and how usable this technology is what would an organization be expected to invest if they wanted to utilize this technology yeah. Um, 
So the technology by itself, uh, the, um, uh, the aircraft, uh, maybe even the docking station, depending a bit on the, the, the type of camera, camera that you take or medical payload, uh, they are ranging from an average car uh, to, a, to, a, to a very expensive car. Uh, uh, so that's a bit of the, the, the price range. Um, we, what we usually uh, do, though, is work uh, not necessarily uh, in a way where we just sell the aircraft and say good luck with, uh, with this. But we work in a, in, in a model where we um, uh, where we deliver um, the technology and, uh, uh, and and also part of the services, especially because it's not that easy uh, uh, to well get the regulations uh, uh, to prove in certain. Uh, uh, regions and we do have a lot of experience with that. We just say, okay, uh, we we deliver the service that uh, you don't have to think about the whole technology, or you'll just get the data uh, that you want, or you or you get your uh, medical goods uh, being delivered uh, in in time, and then you just pay on a uh, on a monthly uh, base, uh, which can be uh, uh, ranging from let's say one thousand five hundred euros. Uh, to four or five thousand euros a month, and then it comes down on uh, how you're going to use the aircraft. So the interesting thing there is that we see some customers they just want the the, the aircraft there as a kind of insurance in case of a, a very large incident. Yep. Um, so they know that whenever uh, something would happen, they would be there uh, within uh, uh, minutes. Uh, but when it becomes really interesting. Uh, uh, um, is when the first responders start to work together. Yeah. Uh, and when, you, um, uh, when, for example, you have one organization using the aircraft um, every morning to do uh, certain checkups. Mm -hmm. uh, here in the Netherlands, you, you, you probably know we, uh, uh, we are big in water management. We have to because everything is, uh, yeah. is uh, quite <laughs> low uh, on the sea level here. Uh, so the inspection of all the dikes around the country is extremely important. So if you can use the aircraft to do dike inspection uh, uh, in the morning, um, then afterwards uh, uh, being used for uh, uh, checking uh, uh, certain nature areas, mm. uh, whenever there is an incident uh, offshore of service uh, being in trouble or missed, uh, then uh, the aircraft gets a prior uh, prioritization uh, towards one of these use cases, flies out there, yeah. um, and whenever there would be a huge uh, incident at an industrial area then the, uh, uh, or area, then the aircraft can be used uh, there. So then, then you uh, then you minimize the cost of the, uh, such an investment um, uh, by being able to use it. Uh, oh well, yeah. Almost the more you use it, the more the more the concept pays for itself. And actually, if, even if you're just yeah. so to try and put some some figures to that, I know you already did anyway. If somebody were investing two thousand euros a month as as an ability to go and do those checks fast response to incidents getting an understanding for you know where and how many resources are required if you tried to transition that into a physical cost so if you tried to do all of the same things with people you could i mean just for a, a crew of firefighters to travel out to an incident and come back you know four firefighters on an appliance to be turned out you'll have covered that cost in one incident you know, that, that, definitely, that yeah. is one, it's yeah. going to be, it's probably more expensive to send us aside for the fact that you risk us and we're and then a, 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 a resource that can't be utilized in other aspects as well. Talk to me about the life yeah, or cycle. 10 minutes of helicopter uh, flying, I yeah, think. Absolutely. <laughs> oh <my yeah>. God, <laughs> yeah. um, how the life cycle of the, of the products. So how long do they last? Well, depending a bit on uh, uh, certain components, but um, uh, we uh, use uh, three years, uh, so 36 months uh, as a depreciation time for one of the uh, uh, the aircraft. Uh, obviously, we do maintenance during that time, uh, and uh, here and there we change uh, certain components that degenerate a bit faster. Um, I would say that the uh, the whole uh, the fuselage of the aircraft can. Uh, 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 has a way longer lifetime than, than just uh, these three years. So yeah. we're also able to refurbish uh, 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 all the aircraft and reuse them again. Um, but that's also why uh, with uh, many uh, uh, clients, we work together more or less in a subscription model. Uh, they they use monthly uh, yeah. uh, payments then, but then we uh, also update them with new technology because yeah. innovations are going so extremely fast uh, uh, that every year again, um, the aircraft uh, uh, and the technology become so exponentially uh, 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 better yeah. uh, that, it, that it is obviously uh, a preference to, mm. to, to use that. 
So that's uh, yeah, how we did it. And people, some people struggle with that because they hear that and they go, oh, right, so it's going to have like bugs and stuff. But I think, no, you think about your smartphone. Yeah, think about the smartphone you have in your hand, your iPhone or your Samsung or your Huawei or whatever you use. How often does that get updated? You probably don't realize it's actually being updated every single day. It is constantly having bugs taken out of it. Every time it taps into a network, it's having an update on one of its applications or one of its processes. So it's constantly being updated. It's, you're constantly getting a new iteration of the software. So the fact that you guys also provide that should should reassure people. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, that's, a, that's exactly uh, how it works. And the, the interesting thing here is that um, obviously we have to design an aircraft and the hardware that, uh, um, that it actually stops. But at, at some point, it, it all uh, comes back to software updates. Uh, and just as with smartphones, we are able to do software updates over over the air, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that because we have connection with the aircraft anyways at all times, um, we can, uh, and it's not just about solving bugs, it's about uh, adding extra features uh, uh, on, on, ongoingly. And uh, so making uh, the, the aircraft better at all times. And one of the interesting thing here is, for example, that, uh, such a thing as the wind resistance. Uh, when we're able to uh, fly in uh, uh, wind conditions of 25 knots with software updates, just uh, uh, software tweaks, uh, making the flight control uh, improve over time, uh, we uh, are able to withstand uh, around 35 knots uh, uh, of wind speed. Uh, so we don't change any. Wow. Yeah. So we don't change anything on uh, uh, on the hardware designer. Um, or uh, any any anything mechanically, it's just all software. Yeah. Uh, same with the uh, the accuracy of the aircraft. I think there was a, um, a great win we had recently, where uh, in the beginning we we used uh, uh, GPS uh, uh, for for the main uh, uh, maneuvering and navigation uh, accuracy. But the thing with GPS is uh, it works fine, but sometimes there's a little bit of a big offset. So can, the, the accuracy can be around one, uh, one meter or something. Then we started to integrate um, uh, not just the American GPS, but also the European Galileo, uh, the Russian uh, GLONASS, the Chinese Be Beidou, and it became a lot better. And then uh, only a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, our software team came up with a solution to, to uh, find uh, uh, any offset um, uh, from a specific location and use that to improve the, the 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 signal and the calculations on how we uh, get to the accuracy and that way uh, uh, they were able uh, to get an accuracy of uh, 14 uh, millimeters meaning that you can <laughs> literally uh, see the movement of uh, you know it's one tenth of an inch i think uh, yeah. no, one twenty of an inch so yeah so it's it's it, it's insanely good uh just just software updates that is that is incredible um before we talk about sort of how people can reach out to the company, I wanted to move into a period where I sort of ask you a few personal questions about yourself because you're clearly an interesting guy and you, you've been on some incredible adventures. So I wanted to start by asking you about habits because we've spoken about the habit of constant innovation, you know, constantly asking yourself for questions. How can we do it better? How can we do it better? That acceptance of failure. But over the past sort of one to three years, what are some of the habits that you think have served you best? I think that uh, a very important thing for me is extreme and maybe even radical honesty. Uh, okay. I think that's a very uh, important part. And I, I think that personally, I, I've seen uh, so many times that uh, when you do that, when you dare to have the courage to be uh, very honest about something and be very open about something, that it might not be easy, but in the end, that it will, it will turn out great. Also, as a company with AV, when we when we started, we we found ourselves in an ecosystem where, especially in all the tech uh, startups and scale ups, uh, everyone is bragging about how great the technology is, and then ultimately uh, they're over promising way too much, and then they have they are they have to under deliver, yeah. um, making uh, uh, you know their 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 customers and clients very unhappy. So it is better than to. Uh, be be very open and honest about uh, expectations, and 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 people and companies will appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so like under promise uh, and the then over deliver, basically. So you know, only only promise things you are absolutely you know implicitly 
you know you consider you can do in an excellent fashion and then everything over and above like you say about the, the software innovations the upgrades to the equipment that is all the over deliver the over deliver always getting more exactly. more for your money than you thought you were exactly exactly mm. and also internally so we've been talking about you know making fuck ups making mistakes failures <laughs> and so on and that's a, that's, that's okay that's part of the deal yeah. also internally we have every every month we have a uh, meet up with the whole team. Uh, we call that uh, our Thursday Thursdays. Uh, we have drinks with the whole company, but we also do, uh, uh, we celebrate our fuck ups uh, yeah. because we think it's so important to, to not be scared about the things that we, uh, uh, that, that went wrong, but yeah. to embrace them, mm. uh, be okay with the fact that, that things not always go as planned, that we learn from them uh, and that we, create safety for everyone to express and to work and w w whatever comes up. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that are, I think, very important parts of what I've learned the last couple of years. What, uh, I remember, I forget what company it was, they used to set off a cannon and celebrate the, the huge failures because they'd, they almost treat, even if they'd done an investment of, of a certain amount, but they'd realized it was the wrong thing to do and they'd lost a little bit of money, they still celebrated the failure because they've basically circumnavigated or they've avoided the exponential failure, which was if nobody said anything, if nobody acted with brutal honesty, like you say that, we'd have kept wandering down this route and we'd have got further yeah. and further when someone's secretly sitting there going, we're going the wrong way. We're going the wrong way. Oh God, I need to tell somebody we're going the wrong way. We made a mistake four turns ago and nobody stood up and went, Patrick, we, we're going the wrong way. My mistake, brother. We should have turned left back there. We need to stop. And you're like, great, yeah. thank you, because I was going to keep going for 20 miles down this direction. <laughs> you're right, you're right. And, 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 the, and the weird thing is that this happens in so many larger companies or organizations oh. where everyone on the working floor feels like it is not going well, but no one dares <laughs> to speak up. Yeah, it's a shame. <laughs> it is a shame. Um, on that note, I wanted to ask you, um, what's a common piece of advice that you think people should ignore from your experience, things that people think are guaranteed or the advice you hear or you heard when you first started the company that you think, that's bullshit. People need to ignore that advice. <laughs> Maybe it would be wait for the right timing. I think that's the worst advice there is. In, uh, there is uh, never a right timing. The only thing that you can do is, is wait and found, find out that uh, you waited too long. So uh, whenever you want to do something, whenever you want to start a business or whenever you want to uh, work on one of your dreams, whenever you want to make impact, whatever, um, the best moment is literally to, to, to start now because every second you work on that topic will teach you something mm. uh, um, that will be, uh, will be valuable uh, uh, for you. And uh, by just waiting for the right timing, which is something you can only know in hindsight, uh, uh, and then even it doesn't make sense anymore, uh, yeah, it's just a sense of bullshit. Uh, don't listen to it. <laughs> Absolutely. And I see that with so many things, you know, all oh, the right time to have a child, the right time to start a business, the right, there's no, there's no right, you're never going to be ready. You're never going to be ready. Right. Because there's, no matter when you start, in the first 10 steps, someone's going to turn around and trip you up. They were always going to do that. So whether you started now or 10 months ago, somebody was going to trip, there was going to be a setback anyway. So just crack on with exactly. it. Do you know what I mean? You're, you're going to have to have your setbacks and uh, you think you've missed one. There's another one around the next corner. You're just going to have to prepare yourself and, and steal your resolve to keep pushing through. Exactly. And what you say, you, you're never going to be ready. is right. And at the same uh, time, whenever you do start with something uh, uh, early, earlier on, it will make you more ready than you previously were <laughs> because you simply have more experience with it. Absolutely. So, yeah. That's why every time I, I think about you know, speaking to people on the podcast as well, I think it's, it's almost such an irony in it. You know, when I first started speaking to people in local services around me, and then I had some, you know, first big guests and stuff like that, and people such as yourself, I think, oh, I'm going to speak to Patrick about drones. I'm like, I don't know anything about drones. You know, I know a little bit. I know a friend that's got a drone. And then I'm like, my, my inner voice goes, who the hell are you to talk to him? You're going to ask stupid questions. But then the other side of me goes, well, then who better to speak to? 
Do you know what I mean? What a yeah. privilege to speak to somebody that does this as, as part of their expertise. The, the selfish part of all of this for me is the amount of development, personal development I get from this and the insights that I get from hearing somebody like yourself so passionately articulate something that, that you have made a, a large part of your life is such a privilege. But if you were constantly scared of like, oh, what if Patrick turns around and asks me a question? I don't know it. Good. Well, you know, yeah. if you just keep telling me stuff I already know and I tell you stuff, I, well, nobody learns anything. What's the point? <laughs> we're not going to learn it. We just, we just keep walking around, patting each other on the back, going, oh, you're so intelligent. No, you're so intelligent. I don't know what he's going to say. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well that's a cool thing, but it, but, but it does require a, a, a courage uh, mm -hmm. to be able to, to step out there. And I think that, you know, um, as human beings, uh, we, we all have our own uh, fears, and that's okay. Um, but the, the, the fact that, we are also equipped uh, with with a, a talent uh, called courage there, and that that helps us to overcome, and uh, not mm. necessarily overcome these fears, but to to work with these fears. Mm. And I think that's an important thing where we should um, uh, inspire each other uh, uh, as a community. In uh, you know, um, it is way more interesting to talk with people uh, about stuff you don't know yet because you'll learn a lot there mm. than, uh, than talk about all the things you already know. How is that going to help you? Whenever <laughs> I go to a, a meeting or a party or whatever, um, the first few times I did it, my friends and people that I know would think it's a bit strange because I wouldn't go and sit with them. I always go and sit with people I don't know. I would just be like a table of people and I'll just go and sit down with them. And at first they all kind of look at you like, uh, hi. And I'm like, Hi. I'm Pete, you know, I've, I've came here from, from wherever. How are you guys doing? You know, what's your name? What do you do? And if it initially people think it's a bit weird, but then you'd be surprised how quickly people just get over themselves. Children are a great example. You know, I, I forget what book I was reading a while ago where they spoke about a family that traveled around trying to learn different cultures and they would go there with their children and the parents would sit down with the elders of wherever and they'd be talking and trying to find a way to communicate and trying to find shared values. In the meantime, within 15 seconds, their kids are running around with the other kids talking and learning and picking up new words and you're like, all it is is fear you're just scared yeah. of so the kids are just going in there optimistic trying to have a connection and they immediately just point at a ball and go hey ball you like play yeah and off they go and then they're making friends and then they're coming back and they've found a rock or they've, they've both got the same colored hair or they're just sitting there and laughing and so many of these barriers so many of these fears we create them we create them ourselves yeah. they're not they're not universal we've created them and i love it the more the more naive i allow myself to be the more i enjoy life people think people hear naive and they're or optimistic and if they, they think you're foolish and i'm like no i'm not foolish you know i i, I weigh up the risks and you know i, I don't just i'm not going to throw money at, at things that are just going to go down the drain or anything like that but I'm always ready to, to be the idiot. And that's the whole point of the podcast half the time is I want to ask the stupid questions because chances are nobody else knows them either. You know, half of my list, there'll be some yeah. people going, oh, Pete, that's obvious. I know everything about Jones. Yeah, okay, then this probably isn't the episode for you. But most of us don't know anything about it. And I'm fascinated with the work that Patrick is doing. But like you say, you've, you've, got, you've got to be willing to step out there and be the one to ask the stupid questions sometimes. And there is no stupid questions, really. Exactly. And I think that that part, that, that, uh, literally the fascination, maybe that's the part where uh, the that, uh, what that kids inspire us with uh, because they're all extremely fascinated about everything. <laughs> yeah. And that's a great part because that helps to overcome any fears uh, uh, that, that we feel. If you're truly fascinated about something, you want to know everything about it. You want to experience it. You want to feel it. And that's an amazing uh, thing, I think, to, to be able to observe all that new knowledge and, and whatever. That's great. I love it, brother. Yeah. Um, You've shared so many fantastic adventures and some of the stuff you've been involved with. I wanted to try and pin you down and, and look for an example of one of the one of the proudest things that you and the company have been involved in. I mean, there's there's several from our conversation you could pick from, but what's an example of something that makes you feel really proud about what you do? It's interesting because I personally always battle a bit with being really proud about something. I think that's part of me that just uh, uh, always wants to continue and wants to grow and wants to move on. So w when you ask that question to me, first thing that, that, that I feel is, no, we, we, we haven't deserved that yet. We yeah, should continue yeah, because yeah. there's still so much potential that we want to tap into. And I can fantasize about many uh, moments when we can really be proud about something uh, where we can really make a massively global uh, uh, impact. 
But I think that's also maybe <laughs> just part of me always uh, working towards the future. Yeah, um, that's the torture uh, genius. Uh, it's the torture genius, and, and I have it. And I don't call myself <laughs> a genius, but it's a bit like when you step when you take one step forward, your vision expands. So like you were so dead set on taking that first step forward. But when you make that first step, your vision expands and you go, oh, wow, wait until we get over there. That is going to be incredible. And then you get there and you go, oh, my God, I've just turned the next corner. And if you've seen what's ahead of us, this is incredible. And it's okay to do that to yourself. It's not okay. But like we, we do it to ourselves all the time, and I do. But you have a team that you work with. So how do you balance not being too proud, uh, ego, whatever, resting on your laurels, but also celebrating the wins. So in, instead of thinking yeah. it was proud, what wins do you celebrate, I suppose, with the team? What are some of the things? Because if I asked you what are you proud of the team about, I'm sure you, you would give me a list and we'd be spending the next hour talking about all the great things your team has done, but you've always got your mind in the future. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and that is challenging sometimes because I'm thinking about 18 to 36 months in the future at least, and sometimes even more. Whereas most of the team is working on things that they're doing right now in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so somehow we have to, to bridge that. Uh, um, and then it really helps to have great people in our team that are able to, to also bridge that gap in between yeah. that, that, that time span. I think that what indeed does make me proud is when I, when I look at the team. So somehow we managed to get a, a, a team of, of, of great people, great engineers, uh, all together that came here because they believe in our mission. And when they found Avion on, on their quest and saw that how we really wanted this technology to do something good, they decided to come work for us. And we have people working here that, that, that came from the military. And we have people working here from very commercial organizations um, earning way more money uh, than they uh, uh, could uh, earn here. But they they believe that much in what we do that they are extremely uh, driven yeah. uh, in, in in developing uh, uh, technology here and well that that makes me uh, super proud the fact that we do that together uh, that everyone is so yeah. extremely ambitious and driven mm -hmm. uh, not because they uh, will get rich uh, with it because they believe that the way they can make yeah. impact that's true engagement isn't it that's true passion you know when 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 a competitor or you know whoever i don't want to keep referring to amazon but people but large companies of the world go hey come and work for us because uh, you could earn twice as much and they go no and then you go why and they go because we're doing something really cool over here and i really enjoy it and they're like shit <laughs> we're not we're, we're not doing cool stuff we're just trying to make money and they're like yeah we, we get paid as well but i really enjoy what i do you know i see the work that patrick and the team are doing and i can see the future i can tangibly see a connection between what we're doing and the value that is going to deliver to, to such a wider group of people than just putting more zeros on the end uh, that's it and then there's there's always a part in us a little part of our ego that wants to earn a lot of money and, and, and wants to show off all, uh, all the cool thing. In. But if you, there will come a, a point in your life and hopefully there will come earlier than, than, to, than, than later, but uh, where you try to check in again, but what is, what do I want to do in life and what, what yeah. is important for me? What impact do I want to make? And, and I think that vision uh, or, 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 or personal mission should be leading in your quest. And, 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 and of course it's important that the things that you do are fun. I th mm. Of course, it's important that yeah. during that that whole quest and setting it out, it, it should be done in a way where you have fun as well. Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> but but I think uh, the, the mission is leading. So yeah, yeah, that's that's a great thing about working here. Uh, I love that, mate, and, that, and that's why I felt that when I spoke to you at the emergency services show and I spoke to the team because it echoes so much of the emergency services. Very few people get into the emergency services because they want to earn a lot of money. If they do, they very quickly realize they're not going to earn a lot of money doing it. Um, but when they look outside at uh, people in different sectors of the world, in different organizations, in different companies, and they know themselves, they're like, but we do something that's really cool. Yeah, you know, we get paid to go and climb up buildings. We get paid to, you know, go and do rescues out of rivers. We get paid to not play with fire, but, you know, we get paid to do something that's really cool. And I always say the biggest currency that we have in life is the impact that we make on other people. You know, that is going to last far longer than anything you, you build or you buy or anything like that. The value that you give to somebody else and the impact you make is massive. And that will last for generations. You know, there'll be, there'll be somebody that has an experience with you and you make a difference in their life and you, they will become that lightning rod of the story. They'll say, yeah, I'm, I met this guy, Patrick, once and he helped us out with this or he came up with this innovative product or they came and helped the team out 
And as a result of that, we did X. And you become part of that story. It's incredible. Yeah, that's what I think as well. So, and, and, and you know, that makes my light shine and, and that of our colleagues as well. And I think of all the first responders and people working in the emergency services. So that again, forms a community, uh, which is so important. It can be so inspiring for so many uh, uh, others as well. So mm. yeah, that, that, that makes me proud. <laughs> <laughs> Final question, absolute final one, I promise, because I want to be respectful of your time. If you had a gigantic billboard or you had a message, one message, it could be a quote that you like, it could be a paragraph, it could be something that means something to you, and you had the ability to share that with the world, something that you think people need to hear, what would be that one statement, that one quote that you think people need to hear? I think that it would be a question similar to, Maybe it would be a text questioning people, where can you make the most impact? Because I hear people uh, say that they are doing great for the world because they started eating less meat uh, uh, or, or, or taking the bicycle to work. And, uh, you know, uh, that's great. Uh, and I'm very happy that you do that. But there's more you can do. And I, and I think as, as humanity, uh, we are facing uh, some really, really big challenges in these times. And it all comes back to us now. Like, how are we going to solve that? We we made we made a massive mess uh, out of many things, and, and now uh, now we have to uh, somehow uh, find a way uh, to solve uh, these situations. But as mankind, we are extremely smart. Uh, um, uh, we are uh, driven. We have huge uh, uh, potential. We have huge talents. Uh, so how are we going to do that? But we need everyone there. So. If, 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 if I could put something on a billboard, that could be an invitation uh, to everyone out there to go back home, look in the mirror, think, okay, what makes you unique in a way where you uh, could make a lot of impact? Go do that now. Absolutely. I've actually got uh, something written on top of my laptop, and it's the next tattoo that I'm going to get. And it says, less impressed, more involved. Because you can look hmm. around at so many things of the world and go, wow, wow, wow. Yeah, okay. Now you do your thing. You get involved as yeah. well. And, uh, and that's exactly what I, I hear when, when you speak and articulate it in that way. Patrick, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. We have been talking, believe it or not, for about two hours. And I can't believe how quickly it goes. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for your time. Send my love to the team. Send my love to the family. I sincerely look forward to maybe being in person one day and, and getting to experience the great work that you do. Thanks a lot, Pete. It was a real pleasure uh, to be here. And uh, thanks for all the great questions. Uh, you inspired me again with all the questions. And uh, yeah, you're very welcome here. The door is always open for me. Thanks a See lot. You, See you. Bye-bye. You too. Hey, everybody. Me jumping back in just to say, wow. <laughs> I mean, what an incredible guy. I mean, and the whole team out there, you know, at Drones for Good. Patrick has really put something so special together. My sincere hope from this is that we have all got a greater insight into how this new technology can be harnessed for the greater good, how it can limit the risk that we place our first responders in, and also how it can allow us to be more efficient and more effective in the way that we deliver care, support, search, rescue, firefighting, you know, law enforcement, medical response to the ever-growing list of challenges that we as frontline operators are facing. So a massive thanks to Patrick. If you want some more information about Drones for Good, look in the notes below. You will see a link to their website. You can contact Patrick and Manon and one of the members of the team will get back to you if you want to learn a little bit more about this. If you want to look at how you can utilize this technology in your organization or in your company, that is the place to go. Thank you once again for coming back to the Firefighters Podcast. It has been my pleasure to have your ears with us for the past hour or so. Thank you for your time. Please support your emergency services wherever you are in the world. And until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, stay hungry. And I'll see you soon right here on the Firefighters Podcast. Podcast.